In this video, we're going to talk about how to calibrate a vector network analyzer. We'll be using this Nano VNA for the demos, but in general this material applies to any vector network analyzer or any VNA. When you purchase a Nano VNA, you usually get some accessories. I got this load or 50 ohm termination, a short and a little open that just doesn't do anything because, quite frankly, that's a pretty decent open at these frequencies. They also typically give you a couple of short cables for doing S21 Cal or for connecting to the things you're going to measure, and a couple of adapters, female-female SMA and male-male SMA. Whether or not you'll need the short open and load depends on what you're going to do. Uh, my Nano VNA came calibrated. And so, in general, I don't really need these. However, I did install some connector savers on here so that over time I won't strip the threads. And that changed the length from the port 1 out to here from where it was, and that required a recal. So when do we need to worry about calibrating the VNA? Well, there's basically three reasons to calibrate. First one is to correct for circuit imperfections in the instrument itself. I said it came calibrated for this Nano VNA, and that's true, and so most of that was already fixed as long as I didn't mess it up. Now if I mess it up, if I change something and save it, then I may write over that calibration that came with the instrument, and I might need to recalibrate. A second reason is to correct for attenuation in cables and connections used in the measurement. So for example, here is a 5 meter cable. This 5 meter cable at the higher frequency end of the range has enough loss that we need to correct for the attenuation, maybe several dB. And last but not least, especially when we're using Smith charts for measuring impedance, we need to correct for phase delays in cables, whatever interconnection we have between the instrument and the device under test, we need to correct for phase delays. So let's take a look at each one of these, starting with correcting for circuit imperfections. That's most easily demonstrated by going to the CAL menu from the top level menu, I hit CAL, and it says correction, it's highlighted, I'm just going to hit it to turn it off. And now you can see what happened. At the low frequencies, we have a couple of dB drop from the 0 dB S11, which was the calibrated line there. At higher frequencies, we have even more drop. S21 should be very low down here because port 1 is not connected to port 2, but it actually jumps up and that's due to limited isolation inside the instrument from port 1 to port 2. And that can be corrected for to a certain extent if you have the right test set up. To demonstrate when you might need to do CAL for number 2, to correct for attenuations in cables and connections used in the measurement, I have this set up with port 1 connected to port 2 using the cable I used during the calibration, and we have a nice blue line here at 0 dB across frequency from 50 kilohertz out to 1 gigahertz. Correction, I've turned back on. But suppose the device we want to measure is not such that we can put it right at the VNA. Maybe we need some long cable links to go to it. This is a 2 meter cable, this is another 2 meter cable over here. And what I've done is connect them together with the male to male SMA that came with the vector network analyzer. Now the S21 line is no longer flat out through 1 gigahertz. In fact, out here at 910 megahertz, it's showing a loss of about 3 decibels. And so if I calibrate again using these two cables in place, then I can get rid of that loss that's part of the cables and not part of whatever I'm trying to measure. And the third basic reason to calibrate a VNA has to do with when you're making impedance measurements. As we'll see, we get phase delays along the coax cables, and we need to calibrate those out if we're going to be able to read the impedance properly on a Smith chart. So to illustrate this, I'm going to go to the trace menu 
and make sure I'm pointing to trace one, so I tap it twice. It's highlighted over here now. I'll hit back and then go to format and change it to a Smith chart. So as it should be for an open circuited port one, the readout is over here on the right hand side of the Smith chart, which we know from a previous video, or you may have known it already, that this is an open circuit. But let's watch what happens when we attach a cable onto here that was not present when we did the original calibration. For this, I'm just going to use one of the original 20 centimeter cables that comes with the VNA, and I'm going to attach it to port 1. The cable's still an open circuit, but now the point is not over at the right hand side, at least not at all frequencies. It's instead anywhere on the chart. It's wrapped around the chart several times. In fact, I moved the marker to 250 megahertz, and the marker is now over here on the left-hand side, which we know is a short circuit. So an open circuit has now become a short circuit at 250 megahertz. But if we're going to connect this cable up to an antenna, for example, we want to know the impedance at this location. We know right now that that's an open circuit, but it's not reading out as an open circuit, and so what we need is a calibration to what's called this reference plane. Having this cable in here and calibrating to an open which is physically located at this distance from port 1 on the analyzer. Now an important point, that's true for this particular setup at 250 megahertz. But if I move the marker down to a lower frequency, in fact down to 50 kilohertz, it's over here and it's a nice open circuit readout as it should be. And at any reasonably low frequency, maybe up to a megahertz or something like that, we're okay. But at higher frequencies, we are decidedly not okay, and we need a calibration. Now, why does this happen when we just put a short length of cable onto the nano VNA? Well, the answer has to do with how short is short. And the answer to that is it depends on the wavelength, which depends on the frequency of the signal. And that's what we're going to walk through here and try to explain. In a previous video titled Nano VNA Demonstrations, Coax Line Reflections and Smith Charts, we went over essentially how the VNA works. I would encourage you to look at that video, especially if you're not that familiar with Smith charts. But what we're going to do here is summarize that and use it to explain what was going on when we attached that short length of coax line. It all starts when the nano VNA launches a signal onto the line. Here we've represented the nano VNA as a voltage source in series with a 50 ohm source resistance. That's pretty decent circuit model for the VNA. Our VNA, the nano VNA, puts out eh, a little over one milliwatt, as we've seen in a previous video as well. And I just represented that as a two volt source signal over here. Now what we've seen before in those other videos is that when you look into a coax line, if the coax line is sufficiently long, the signal has no idea initially what's at the other end of the line down here. What it sees instead is capacitances and inductances that are formed by the line itself and through magic, not really magic, but through math, that resolves to it looks like a 50 ohm resistance coming into the line. Then that signal, which is composed of a voltage but also a current, which is 1 volt divided by 50 ohms, flows down the line from left to right. And it takes some time because there's a velocity of propagation which is not infinite. It's the speed of light or actually in coax about maybe 66%. It depends on the type of coax. And that signal is going to get reflected because it cannot go into the open circuit. There's current coming out here but it has nowhere to go. And so the only thing that can happen is a new current gets generated which comes back in the other direction. That's what a full mathematical analysis will show us. But physically, that's what's going on. In the example we've been looking at, our coax, which is 20 centimeters long, is about one quarter of a wavelength. So we would expect that the delay 
would be on the order of one quarter of a cycle. And that's what we're representing here in the diagrams. On the left hand side is the signal that was launched onto the coax. It's a sine wave. This is a time axis. This is a voltage axis. And it's a sine wave at whatever frequency we're dealing with. That generates the forward traveling voltage wave and an associated current wave. And the voltage and current, which carries power with it, gets to this other end a quarter of a cycle later. But notice that the voltage here is shifted to the right in time, or delayed in time, by one quarter of a period. What happens when it reaches the end of the coax? In our particular example, we have an open circuited coax. So the signal is going to get reflected. That power cannot go anywhere, so it's going to be forced to get reflected back. In a detailed mathematical analysis, what we would find is there's a current trying to come out here. It cannot go out there because there's nowhere to go in an open circuit. So an equal and opposite direction current gets created at the open circuit at end, comes back into the coax, sees 50 ohms, and generates a voltage which is basically the same as the voltage that was coming this way. But those two voltages add. So what we have is this picture. The signal that came from the generator looks like this. The signal that now is generated at this end and flowing back toward the generator looks like this, and it's identical. What that means is, at this end of the line, S11, the reflection coefficient, has a size of 1 and has a phase relationship. These two waveforms are in the same phase. Phase relationship of 0 degrees. So S11 is 1 at an angle of 0 degrees. And that's what it should be for an open circuit. However, that signal is now coming back to the left, and it has a propagation delay coming back. And so it arrives later and looks like this. So compared to the outbound wave, it's now got an opposite phase, or 180 degree phase. So what does the network analyzer see? Instead of S11 equals 1 at an angle of 0 degrees, it doesn't see what's going on at this end. It only sees what's going on at this end. And now it's got the magnitudes are the same, but the phase relationship is 180 degrees. So instead of 1 at an angle of 0 degrees that it should report for an open circuit, it's telling us it's 1 at an angle of 180 degrees. And that's what you would have if you were measuring a short circuit. So it displays it as a short circuit. But it only looks like a short circuit at one frequency. In our example, 250 megahertz with our 20 centimeter line. Now, if you've got a nano VNA or any other VNA yourself and a short piece of coax like this 20 centimeter line, I would encourage you to hook it up and try this. All right. Let's talk about how to calibrate the vector network analyzer, or in our case, the nano VNA. In this video, we're just going to talk about a one-port calibration, in particular right now, an S11 cal. Then we'll briefly go over S21 cal as well. So here's a basic one-port S11 calibration procedure broken down into eight steps. Step one, decide if you actually need to recalibrate or calibrate the VNA. So I want to do this particular calibration up through 500 megahertz instead of the default 1 gigahertz that it's set on now. So I'm going to bring up the menu again. I'll select stimulus and stop frequency. I'm going to change that to 500 megahertz. In the case of the VNA I got, it came calibrated to the connector at port 1. But when I added these connector savers, I decided to recalibrate because it threw off the calibration at high frequencies a little bit. Now, as we've shown in this video, when I added this short cable here, that threw off the calibration quite a bit for the case of Smith chart measurements, when I actually want to measure the impedance value. However, if I was just going to look at S11 log magnitude, the losses on this cable are probably not sufficient enough to matter. So I probably would not recalibrate. Because on the log magnitude scale here, I get a nice flat 0 dB line 
almost perfectly across frequency, even out at the high frequencies, the cable loss is not very much because it's only 20 centimeters long. However, let's say I was trying to measure something at the end of this 5 meter coaxial cable that's open circuited at the end and should have a reflection coefficient of 1, which in dB is 0 dB. This line should be, as we saw a minute ago, flat at 0 dB, but instead it's decaying. That's because I've got losses along the line. And out here, I've got probably about 6 dB of loss out here at this higher frequency. So steps 1 and 2 are somewhat the same. Depending on the cable length, that is where the reference plane is relative to the nano VNA port 1, I may or may not want to recalibrate. I need to decide on that reference plane, and that consists of the configuration of cables and connectors between the VNA and the device being measured. The next thing you'll want to do before you start the calibration is to make sure you have some good references, usually termed shorts, opens, and loads, one of each. And the rest of the steps in the calibration are 4 through 8. All right, let's get started. So I'm going to do step 4, set the measurement channel to S11, bring up the menu, go to display, channel, and I have S11 here. That's what it was already on. The S11 was highlighted, and so I didn't have to do that. But you want to make sure that you're calibrating with the correct channel. I'm currently in log magnitude display, so again, I'm going to go to the menu, and I will select Format and Smith Chart. The next step is to turn off the existing calibration. So I will hit back from the menu I was in, hit Cal, and I hit Correction to unhighlight it. Notice when I did that, that the S11 plot is now vastly different. This is due to the inaccuracies in the circuitry of the device itself. Remember when we talked about why you want to calibrate? One of the main things was the calibration fixes inaccuracies in the instrument itself. When I turn off the correction, those become blatantly obvious. Step six is to start the calibration and present the short open and load references. So I go to Cal. Correction is off. I'm going to hit Calibrate, and this is an open, or I could put this little open cap on the end of it. At these frequencies, it doesn't matter. At higher frequencies, it does. I'm just going to leave it off. I'm going to hit Open. All right, the next thing is it's telling me it wants me to present a short, so I will put that on. Now, once it's all settled down, I hit Short. Now it says put the load on. So this is my 50 ohm termination load that I put on. It should go somewhere toward the center, and it does. And I hit load. And at this point, since I'm only doing an S11 cal, I'm basically done. We'll cover isolation and through later. So I'm going to hit done. And it automatically prompts me to say, where do you want to put it? I'm going to save it in 4, because I don't want to write over things that I like from previous cows. 4 is kind of my temporary dummy place that I use when I'm experimenting. The last step is a verification step, and we've already got part of that. The load is still on it. It's at the center quite well. I'm going to take the load off. Where should it go? It should go over to the right-hand side. And it does. So that looks good. And lastly, let's put the short back on. Remember, the short is the cap that has the little pin in it. Put that on. And that looks like a good short. So I think I have a decent cal here. As one final check, I put a 75 ohm resistor at the end here. And let's see how that measures. Hmm, okay, well, 75 ohms should be along the horizontal line here in the center of the Smith chart. Instead, it's up higher. The reason for that is 
I've got the marker set at 470 megahertz and at 470 megahertz this is not actually a good 75 ohms. It's actually 75 ohms in series with the inductance of the wire that is part of the resistor. And so that's what we're seeing here. It reads out as 77 in series with about 9 nanohenries. So that's not a problem with the calibration. That's actually measuring the physics of what a resistor looks like when you include the lead links in it. Of course, it is possible to create good 75 ohm resistances without that lead length. This is the one I just measured. Here is a surface mount 75 ohm resistor. And this is on the RF demo kit that we showed in a previous video. So finally, let's talk about calibrating for S21. S21 is the gain from port 1 to port 2. And with a cable connecting the two, assuming there's no loss in the cable, we should have 0 dB. If you look at the blue trace, that's what we have. Here I've returned to my original cal that either came with the device or I wrote over it when I added my connector savers. I can return to that by recalling wherever it's stored. In my case, it's recall 0. Now for this demo, I'm not interested in S11, so I'm going to turn off that trace leaving only S21. So this S21 cal looks fine. It's 0 dB from 50 kilohertz to 1 gigahertz. So when would I need to recalibrate for S21? Here's one answer. If I'm going to measure something which is far away from the network analyzer, then I'll need long cables. Here I have a 2 meter cable connected to a 5 meter cable through this junction here. And we can see that out at the high frequency end, around 1 gigahertz, looks like we have about 4 dB of loss through here. Even at 500 megahertz in the middle, we've got a couple of dB of loss. And that might be important for whatever measurements we're trying to make. It might be important to get that back to zero. So here's a quick calibration to do that. Let's bring up the menu again. I'm on trace 1 and I've turned off trace 0. If I was on trace 0, first thing you want to do is make sure that you select trace 1 before you do the cal. So I'm going to leave trace 0 on, turn on tra S11, turn on trace 1, make sure it's highlighted. Now it was already on, but now it's highlighted. Then I'm going to hit the back key here, back up again, hit cal, I think I could leave correction on, but in general I like to turn it off before I do stuff. So I turned it off. We have even more loss now. But we're going to calibrate. And I'm just going to do a through cal. So I'm going to hit through. And then done. And then I'll save that in my temp that I always use, temp 4. Register 4. And we notice now that we're basically 0 dB from 50 kilohertz to 1 gigahertz as we wanted. Now I'd like to say that that's all there is to it. But there is a little secret about these nano VNAs. They are not the same quality as a lab instrument. Let me show you what I mean. If I disconnect the cable from port 1, then what should happen? Well, there should be no gain from port 1 to port 2, so the blue line should move from 0 dB down to the bottom of the screen. Let's see what happens when I disconnect it. Okay, that is not the bottom of the screen. It should be down here, but it's actually, let's see, this is 0 dB, minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, minus 40 dB to minus 50 dB across much of the frequency range. Now you might argue that that might have to do with the fact that this cable is near that connector. But if that were true, then as I move it in and out, it should go up quite a bit as I get closer if there was capacitive coupling. And that's not the case. The problem is that there's internal limitations in the circuitry 
that prevent high isolation from port 1 to port 2 inside the device. And I skipped the isolation step when I did the CAL. You can, to some extent, improve your measurement capability beyond what you see here if you do the isolation step. But that's kind of a long and involved discussion, so I don't think we're going to do that here today. So we're going to end it here. These were the basic reasons to calibrate the VNA, and we've illustrated all of these. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, uh, leave them in the comment section below. And I check periodically, not real often, so I apologize if I don't get back right away. And as always, thank you for watching.